Okay, so mine is a little bit controversial and not not the least of which because we just did an episode on ethical investing. So uh, I'm so <laughs> I curious. That, <laughs> I want to put that caveat right at the front. The company I've chosen is Raytheon, New York Stock Exchange ticker RTN. And for those that uh, aren't familiar with the company, it's in the uh, it's a defense contractor. It's a se- essentially a weapons manufacturer. So highly unethical. The reason that I chose it was I, I just started doing some research on it, and I figured. It was an interesting company based on what's going on around the company at the moment. And the reason I started looking into it was because Donald Trump has had some issues nominating a Secretary of Defense, the head of the US Defense Force, as the name suggests. He tried to nominate a former Boeing executive, and then that nomination fell over. And so he's landed on a former Raytheon lobbyist, Mark Esper is his name. And so reading about this former corporate lobbyist who now runs the Defence Department got me thinking about what that will do for the company and that got me researching the company and here I am today. So definitely not a buy or sell recommendation, more just uh, a company that I found fascinating in an industry that I knew nothing about and I'm interested to hear both of your takes on on the company. So Ren, does that mean you think that the US is headed for war? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I think these companies do particularly well obviously in wartime but they do particularly well when there's tensions heightened. And I think if we look at Iran um, and the Middle East at the moment, if we look at the ongoing stress that North Korea is causing, and if we look at the tensions in the South China Sea, I think regardless of whether the US is going to war or not, there's enough defense hawks in the US that think they're going to war, and they're probably going to be upping their procurement of, uh, of weapons. That's That makes sense. I mean, this is a really interesting company. There's a resilient portfolio there, lots of international exposure happening. And I guess um, a lot of the world is pricing in the possibility of a US recession and generally during weak economic growth, you not only get a fall in interest rates, but hopefully a rise in government spending. So that could be things like defence, which um, Raytheon is involved in. Um, or it could be things like infrastructure, which has been popular as well. So, yeah, I like the um, thinking behind that. What do you think, Bryce? Yeah, so, Ren, love, love the, the choice of uh, going overseas and really liked the insight into how you found this company and then um, dug a bit deeper. I have no idea about it, to be honest, until we spoke about this prior to the show. So I'm wondering, where does Raytheon sit relative to its competitors? Does it hold a monopoly? Um, you know, ha- where is it in the total market? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And let me, let me give a bit of a spiel and uh, come to that answer in a roundabout way. So, <laughs> so, so Ray, Raytheon is one of the biggest companies. It's not the biggest. Uh, Lockheed Martin, I believe, is the biggest defense contractor globally. Uh, Raytheon is big in its own right, though. Its current market cap is $49 billion, and it did $27 billion in sales last year. And the thing with defense contractors is... They the way that they they sell is different to your traditional company that goes to customer goes to consumers or goes to businesses and tries to sell. Sixty sixty seven percent of Raytheon sales came to through the U.S. government, and then another twelve percent of their sales came was to foreign governments, but via the U.S. government because they're making massive weapon systems. They really can only sell to governments. And because they're an American company, it really all has to go through the US government. So their sales cycle is a little bit different. And really what they rely on is government tenders. And the government, the US government will say, we need a new 
fleet of submarines and we'll go out to the the different weapons manufacturers and see what's available and we'll put an order in and then you know that that provider will have a contract you know multi-billion dollar contract for submarines and then they'll do the same thing for missiles and they'll do the same thing for tanks and etc cetera, etc cetera. and you, you just have to look at uh, Lockheed Martin who has the contract for the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the new plane that the US procured and then the US basically made all of its allies procure. So for example, Australia at the moment is buying a whole lot of planes from Lockheed Martin because the US told them to. So it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a different uh, business. They all seem to have monopolies in certain areas. Raytheon has a particular strength in missiles, missiles. and missile <laughs> defense. Yeah. And they are uh, they sell a lot in. They sell Patriot missile defense systems, which was a name that kind of rang a bell, I guess, from movies and TVs. But yeah, so so that's really their strength. Taking a leaf out of your book, Julia, and you you talk about what's the catalyst for change for a business, and I think there's probably three catalysts that are interesting at the moment. Um, the first one is one that I touched on, which was. Mark Esper, who's now essentially a head of head of uh, the Defence Force, which means he's leading Defence Force procurement. He's a former Raytheon lobbyist. He obviously has a lot of connections to that company, and that maybe gives Raytheon a an advantage when they're tendering for government business. So that's number one. Uh, number two is that these businesses are very dependent on U.S. foreign policy. Because they they sell into the U.S. government, but then they also try and sell into U.S. allies. But everything has to be approved by the U.S. government. And what we've seen from the Trump administration is a real willingness to let their allies buy weapons. You know, they've encouraged he's encouraging Europe to buy more weapons. He's encouraging Australia to buy more weapons. He's encouraging his Asian allies to buy more weapons. He's happy to sell U.S. products around the world. And so as morbid and as unethical as it sounds, companies like Raytheon probably will benefit from the lax uh, Trump administration policy around exporting weapons and selling weapons to allies. You know, for example, 5% of Raytheon's total sales come from selling to the Saudi government and people in the Obama administration made a lot of noise about stop uh, stopping weapon sales to the Saudis while they were fighting a war in Yemen. The Trump administration has no such qualms, and so you can see that that will have an, a positive effect on these weapons contractors. And then the third catalyst is Raytheon are uh, merging with United Technologies, uh, ticker UTX, and this combined company will make the second largest defense and aerospace contractor in the world. And what you see in this business is that there's a real power law in defense contracting. A lot of the benefit continues to accrue to the biggest players in the field. Uh, A stat that I pulled out, 74% of the revenue generated in 2017 went to the top 20 uh, largest contractors. And so there's probably an argument that as these companies get bigger, they insource more expertise, they can service larger government contracts, they win more tenders, and there's a real power law and the benefit keeps accruing to the biggest in the field. So I think there's probably three catalysts there that mean Raytheon is a is an interesting company to watch, uh, albeit, an, albeit an unethical one. Nice. Has the merger been priced into the stock at the moment do you think or where's when's the merger happening do good know? question don't don't know the date it's been announced i imagine i'm not actually is it a sure done deal or just i'm not sure where it is in the sort of competition regulator process julia do you know it's 
should be around the first half of uh, 2020, I think, they're aiming for. So I guess when you do see mergers and it does involve stock, as it does in this case, there's a question of whether to get into the merger via United Technologies or Raytheon. And I guess I like the idea of getting in through Raytheon because of its missile technology and you're, I guess, avoiding some of the United Technology space, which is involved in space, I think aerospace. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a good way to play the merger as well. So I guess the catalyst that would change your opinion on this, Ren, is if the merger doesn't go ahead. Would I be right? Yeah, I think you would uh, You would definitely revise what you think of the company based on that. I also think given, um, given Trump has announced a separate service in the Space Force, uh, there will be a lot of government procurement that comes out of that. So, you know, if Raytheon aren't going to have, aren't going to merge with an aerospace contractor, then that probably does change your assessment of their, their future prospects. They do have an aerospace and uh, space systems division, but uh, not, not probably not their traditional strong point. Nice, Ren. Well, I don't have any more questions on Raytheon. I think uh, I'll add it to my watch list for sure and keen to see how this uh, merger really plays out. But really good find. As I said, I think it was a really interesting uh, insight into how you found the company and and came across it. You know, a lot of um, listeners write in and ask, where do we find all this information and stuff? And it just goes to show by, you know, reading and and digging down the rabbit hole, how you can come to a, a pretty good thesis around a company without you know needing to know too much about it before you get started so thanks for that 